Hello, everybody, and we're going to start off with a question for my audience. What did the Allied forces do with the German prisoners that were captured during World War II? I bet most of you have never thought about this, as it's not something that gets discussed in school. But if you thought that they were just held in Europe for the duration of the war, you'd be incorrect. When I was growing up, I heard mention of German POWs being housed in Wisconsin, but it never got discussed in detail. All I knew was an unknown amount of POWs were brought to Wisconsin, and some of those POWs liked it so much that they decided to stay. While there is a grain of truth to this, it is far from the whole story. So why don't we discuss that today? Going back to my original question of what did we do with these prisoners? Well, the answer is, the first few years of the war, they were held in Great Britain. However, in 1942, there were rumors that the Germans were going to attempt an airdrop of weapons to prisoners being held in Great Britain. The idea was that these prisoners would then attack from within the country. Whether or not these threats were credible, it did push Great Britain to ask the United States to take control of all current and future prisoners the Allied forces would capture. This made sense for multiple reasons. The first reason being the United States and Great Britain didn't have to worry about Germany mounting an attack to try and free their prisoners. The other reason was related to supplies. In 1942, most of the resources were coming from the United States, including the supplies needed to hold the POWs. It made more sense to ship the prisoners to the United States rather than continue to ship supplies to Europe in an effort to hold them. In total, the United States held more than 425,000 German prisoners throughout the war. Take a minute and try to guess how many of the states held these prisoners. The answer? At one point or another, all except four states would house these POWs. Today, I'm only going to focus on one state, and that is Wisconsin. Surprise, surprise, I'm a little bit biased to my home state. Little did I know, 20,000 German prisoners were held in the state during the war. There were 39 different camps existing throughout the state, one of which was considered a base camp. This was often a pre-existing arming base that the POWs were filtered through. Fort McCoy was the only base camp in Wisconsin, but Fort Sheridan in Illinois was another base camp that the POWs went through before arriving in Wisconsin. That left 38 branch camps. These camps were in communities throughout the state. And in alphabetical order, these camps were in Antigo, Appleton, Barron, Bayfield, Beaver Dam, Billy Mitchell Field, which is Milwaukee, Cambria, Chilton, Cobb, Columbus, Eau Claire, Fond du Lac, Fox Lake, Fredonia, Galesville, Genesee, Green Lake, Hartford, Hortonville, Janesville, Jefferson, Lake Keezus, Lodi, Marcuson, Marshfield, Milltown, Oakfield, Plymouth, Reedsburg, Rhinelander, Ripon, Rockfield, Sheboygan, Sturgeon Bay, Sturdvant, Waterloo, Wapan, and Wisconsin Rapids. So, if any one of my listeners are from these areas and you have any extra information, feel free to let me know. Even if I didn't just list off your community, but your community was in the area of one of those camps, POWs might have still worked in those areas. For example, Camp Chilton was located in the northeastern part of the state, 
but they actually transported POWs into Calumet County, where Chilton was, as well as Brown and Manitowoc County. But neither Manitowoc nor Brown County actually had a camp inside them. So while there's 39 camps throughout the state, more communities employed these POWs throughout the war. Some of the camps took over pre-existing buildings. For example, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, the old asylum was taken over by the military to create the camp. The Schwartz Ballroom in Hartford, Wisconsin, was another building taken over to house the POWs. Even the largest airport in Wisconsin, which is General Mitchell International Airport, housed these prisoners in their hangars during World War II. Maybe in another episode, I'll talk about how Wisconsin named an airport after a general who had been court-martialed, but that's a whole nother story. Other camps, however, were tent cities, often located at fairgrounds such as Columbus and Appleton, Wisconsin. Every camp had one central location that held POWs in Wisconsin, except for one. That camp was in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, which actually had seven different camps. The reason was likely due to the abundance of temporary housing available. This was because the cherry picking season in Door County usually depended on both local and foreign labor, which means that orchards in Door County had barracks already made to house the foreign labor. In 1945, they held German prisoners instead. I've alluded to this already in the episode, but these prisoners were not just sitting around in these camps all day, every day. Instead, these prisoners were being used to fill the labor shortage the war had caused. Many of the able-bodied men who usually participated in the yearly harvest were either being sent to the European or Pacific front. Those who were not being sent to war, women included, often moved to larger cities to take better paying industrial jobs. This left the agricultural industry short staffed, especially during seasonal work. While following the Geneva Convention guidelines, prisoners of war were utilized to fill the shortage. The Geneva Convention rules stipulated the work conditions must be safe and the prisoners had to be paid for their work. The prisoners were used from 1944 to 1946 in Wisconsin, even after the war was over. There had to be time to organize the repatriation of soldiers back to Germany. In the meantime, they continued to be used in the labor force. The POW saved a large amount of crops from going to waste in 1944 to 1946. In Wisconsin alone, it is estimated that the POWs made $3.3 million for the United States government through their labor. So if you're a little confused on how we have to pay the Germans for their labor, but we're making money off of the POWs, let me explain. The prisoners' labor was often contracted out to individual farmers or canning companies in Wisconsin. These companies would then pay the United States the normal pay for labor, but the POWs would only receive 80 cents per day. To give you an idea how this would work, in Sturgeon Bay, the US government was getting paid 40 cents per hour of POW labor. Multiply that by an eight hour workday. That is $3.20, of which, the government got to keep $2.40. Not to mention that Sturgeon Bay was one of the largest camps, at one point holding over 1,200 prisoners. The army was making bank off of these prisoners, as well as filling the labor shortage. Oftentimes, these prisoners were working side by side with Wisconsinites. I think the relationships they formed is quite a unique one, which is why my next episode will be solely focused on discussing the relationship these POWs had with members of the community. So I won't get into it too much right now. I will say that the army was worried about having enemy soldiers in these communities and feared backlash. 
Therefore, they tried to keep quiet about the communities housing the prisoners. It often varies from camp to camp how much reporting was done. Sometimes nothing was published. Other times, like in Sturgeon Bay, multiple articles were published about the prisoners and life within the camp. There are many opinions about housing these POWs. There were some who supported them, while others opposed them. Both sides will be discussed in the next podcast. As the war began to wind down, these Germans had to be returned to Europe. While some of the Germans enjoyed their stay in Wisconsin and wished to remain, all prisoners of war had to be repatriated back to Germany. They were given a clean set of clothes and a check for the money they had earned working. The POWs entered Europe, either through Britain or France. In Britain, the POWs were often detained for re-education purposes and sometimes forced into labor for another year or two before being sent home to Germany. This was the more pleasant experience for POWs returning to Germany. Those who entered Europe through France had their hard-earned money confiscated and then forced into labor, often for two to three years, or until they escaped. These Germans were forced to work in much harsher conditions than they had in the U.S., while receiving little to no pay or food. Kurt Penchman was one of the POWs who returned through France. He left the United States weighing 185 pounds. By the time he escaped back to Germany, he weighed 85 pounds because all he was surviving off of was stolen crops. Forced labor, being starved to death, sounds exactly like what the Germans had done to millions of people. Yet until researching the German POWs, I had never known that the French, who had been part of the Allied forces, had done similar things to returning Germans. The war was over, and this is my opinion, but I find it wholly inexcusable the actions of the French. Their treatment of these German soldiers was no better than the Nazis the Allied forces had just defeated. Once these Germans finally arrived back home, they often found their cities destroyed, sometimes their families killed. Those who lived in East Germany found themselves arrested by the Soviet-controlled government, sometimes never to be seen again. They were considered corrupted by Western ideals. In West Germany, they found themselves struggling to find work. As a result, some returned to the United States after the war. It is estimated that 5,000 former German POWs returned to the United States after the war. The exact total of returned POWs to Wisconsin is unknown, but there are multiple accounts of these Germans returning, including Mr. Penchman who had been detained in France. Oftentimes, they would reach out to employers and community members they had met while working in Wisconsin to get sponsorships and visas during the immigration process. Despite the large number of prisoners of war that have resided and worked in Wisconsin during World War II, their stories have slowly disappeared from our state's history. It's a shame considering what an interesting part they played in our wartime history. Hopefully this episode has given you some background on these German prisoners. And hopefully you will join me for my next episode, where I will discuss the relationship between these POWs and their communities. Until next time, I want you to think about how would you react if your country was at war and suddenly captured enemy soldiers were being housed in your community? And how would your perspective change if you had family fighting in the war? Could you find a way to be kind to them or would you look at them in hatred?
Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you're interested in finding out more, a lot of my research came from Stileg, Wisconsin, Inside World War II Prisoner of War Camps by Betty Cowley. I also used newspapers from the Dora County Library's online Dora County Advocate collection, as well as the Sheboygan County Historical Research Center. If you liked this episode, we do have a Facebook page that should be linked down below. So please check that out. And please, please, please like and share on Facebook or any of your social media with friends and family. Thank you so much.